Howdy, hey guys, gals, and other pals, ghouls of all ages. Welcome back to Shadow Running on Empty, a podcast where we fill your heads, your noggins, your sweet, sweet meat baskets with some delicious, delicious lore. Anyway, I'm Tyler. I'm one of your hosts. I'm joined here by my comrade at arms, my my bear wrestling broski, my vodka drinking vagabond. Austin, how's it going? Oh, it's going well, man. My meat basket is always looking for more content. I so. heard that about you. Yep, so uh, that is true and valid. Uh, we're doing good. I'm interested uh, to see what is uh, going on, but the person uh, to give us a better peek behind that iron curtain might, in fact, be <sighs> Easy himself. Easy, how you doing this evening? I guess I'm taking the, the meats out of the oven to deliver the delicious lore that is the meats whoa whoa you whoa you put your meat in the oven what what kind of savage in this weather look look sometimes you gotta sear it all right yeah that's what a grill's for oh yeah oh this guy a pan sear never heard of a pan sear -sear. yes yes (laughs) savages whenever we get merch i need a shirt that's just a slab of meat and it just says lore on it (laughs) Put that meat lore in your brain bucket. <laughs> sweet, sweet lore meat. Sweet lore meat. <laughs> you ever seen lore like this? Slaps yeah. lore meat. <laughs> <laughs> Look at that. This is prime lore right here. <laughs> this is 100% grass fed Oklahoma lore. FDA approved. FDA approved lore. This right here in the hind quarters, this is 95% fat. That comes from a book written in the 80s. Fat. <laughs> it's, it's the juicy bits that come from this little novella. Oh my god. I hope you enjoy the sweet taste of papyrus. Papyrus. I need I need someone to break down a cow into parts that would just be instead of meat cuts, it's lore. It's lore. <laughs> <laughs> like fan fiction is in one section deep cuts fans fan fiction would be like the would be like the genital pelvic region <laughs> of uh, of the meat cut i believe True. the fan fiction is what gets put in hot dogs uh, yeah oh, yeah it's so, so so it's all the, it's, it's all the mm-hmm. hooves and the other bits <laughs> fan fiction is the hot dog of lore there you go this, put that this, on a t-shirt this was the talk there you go was, this is what people come here to this podcast for is that- this is exactly what people come here for. Uh, not, not necessarily the lore itself, but how we cut up the lore and serve it to you. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. I think someone said, like, in, in one of the recent episodes, they said, like, less than five minutes in, and we're talking about, uh, oh, crap, what are they called? What 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 is the thing? The... Gigolos. No, 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 but also true. What was the thing? Ah, shoot. What's it called? The, like, the secret organization that names cryptids the, the, C- oh the, the, S- S- the scp SCP. yeah they're like SCP. five minutes in oh, okay. five less than five minutes in we're talking about scps or something like that we no, can always be talking warning. about scps man. yeah That's... and i scrub through just to check and yeah i scrub through and the first thing i hear is easy trying to denounce the australian lore that is the migrating of the juggalos <laughs> <laughs> which was <laughs> the great juggalo migration <laughs> yeah of the sixth world <laughs> Oh man! Canon. Uh, uh, yes, clearly. You heard it here, second, folks. <laughs> we made it so. Ah, mm-hmm. uh, well, tonight's delicious cut of lore is <laughs> brought to you none other than by the Red Nation itself. That's right. We're going to Mother Russia. This lore is for the people. It is. It's the people's <laughs> lore. And we're going to provide it to them. So I guess the best way to start is none other with the Russian timeline. Da, 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 da. That's not nearly haunting enough to be the theme song of the Russian timeline. Well, well I'll have to get some Russian march music to put in there. <laughs> I was going to say... Da, 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 <laughs> yeah, I was going to say... 
Command and Conquer, the mm, mm-hmm. Hell's March song mm-hmm. is all I hear. Mm-hmm. Of course. Or any of Zongief's themes. <laughs> uh, yeah, Dude, any of his. Okay. All of right. I, I swear to God, we're going to talk about stuff for the podcast, but <laughs> Eventually. Fighter 6 came out. And yes. Zangief's theme is is a 12 out of 10 banger. I will not hear anything <laughs> yeah. else. No, it is. Every time I fight a Zangief before he pile drives me into the fucking concrete, I'm like, <laughs> hell yeah, Red, this song's awesome. Dude, everything about Zangief and Street Fighter 6 is a 12 out of 10. I, I got over the fact that he has a weird face, but it's also more realistic. And also just, he knows what he's about. You know, it's time to get serious. And then he pile drives you. His mm-hmm. fucking mm-hmm. cocky walk that he does before he hits you with the ultimate is like my favorite thing ever. <laughs> it's so good. He does that little march walk and then he just fucking grabs you. And Have I was you... like, hell yeah, dude. Well, and then he also has like a between rounds win animation where he just goes on his head and he's doing like neck exercises. No, no, that's his, <laughs> that's his perfect. That's if a you perfect? Get, that's his perfect animation. If you get a perfect with him, he does the neck stretch. Yeah, which is amazing. Oh man. It's wow. so good. It is well, so good. I'm gonna have to look into this later. It's worth <laughs> it. Good old Geef, man. He's you know he's still beef, out there. Beef, Geef he is beef, beef, man. He's beef, doing it. Beef. Mm-hmm. Okay, now we're back on topic. No, so uh, let's jump right into 2016. President Cherlinko is assassinated during a three-week period in which the leaders of the United States, Great Britain, and Israel are picked off as well. The MVD forces kill Shalinko's assassin during a violent confrontation, and news reports later paint the assassin as delusional, but conspiracy theories abound. Because, of course, they do. In 2018, the Transpolar Aleut Council claims a portion of northeastern Siberia. In 2026, Boris Krupkin becomes general secretary. In 2030 to 2031, the indigenous forces, assisted by shapeshifters, take over the autonomous region of Yakut, declaring independence from Russia. Interior army forces fail to retake the territory. You'd so think you that said, they would have learned from the Americans, but I guess not. So, oh, okay, because these were natives mm-hmm. as well, but they were yep. shapeshifters. Uh, it was shapeshifters and uh, other forces, other indigenous forces. So probably uh, free spirits and shamans. Trying to take back their uh, gotcha. native territory, yeah. Oh. Much like the Native Americans did in North America. In 2031 to 2033, we have Euro Wars 1, where Russian forces invade Poland and drive into East Germany before being halted by the Night Wraith airstrike. Whoa, that sounds dope. Yeah, the Night Wraith uh, was a joint operation from NATO forces spearheaded by Britain. In 2034, we have Euro Wars 2, because one wasn't enough. NATO is still around at this point? Or is it has NATO, has NATO stayed and it's just the UN that dissipated, or did NATO also? No, NATO stayed and okay. the UN is more dissolved. Right, okay, okay. I guess that would make sense since NATO is more of a militaristic type yes. deal. So that would make sense to have them <laughs> stick around. Uh, in 2034, we have Euro Wars 2, where the Alliance for Allah forces mm-hmm. drive through Armenia, Azerbaijan, and Georgia. Mm-hmm. Russian re- Russia redeploys forces in Eastern Europe southward into the Caucasus Mountains. And the AFA drive stalls following the assassination of their leader. Ah, uh, yes, the Euro Wars too. A la Boogaloo. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Aha, la Boogaloo. Twenty thirty five. General Secretary Krupkin resigns over the failure of the Euro Wars. Great disgrace. 
the Democratic Recovery Alliance takes power and initiates half-hearted reforms. Vladivostok, Rostov, and other strategic cities closed since 2009 reopen. Look at them trying to make cities better again. In 2037, the National Soviet Reconstructionists defeat the Democratic Recovery Alliance in national elections after the alliance fails to bring about economic recovery. Democracy just didn't do it for Russia, so they had to step back. Yeah, that checks out. I, I'm pretty sure that that's just been the accurate, the accurate history of Russia for like the past, what, 200 years, right? <laughs> yeah, sounds right. Something like oh, that. Oh, you, you weren't just reading world history right now. No, no this is this that's is right. six world, but, but mm -hmm. I can see the correlation. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> In 2059, Yamatetsu relocates its corporate headquarters from Kyoto, Japan to Vladivostok, Russia. In 2064, General Secretary Perlinko announces his retirement due to health concerns and appoints General Dmitryas <laughs> Ogzurznev to succeed him. However, in January 23rd of 2064, oh no, he's I'm jumping ahead. Uh. Sorry, sorry. Oh, spoilers. I know. I don't want to spoil it yet. In January 23rd of 2064, Siberian rebel forces known as the Sagan Zaba Brigade seizes control of Yakut territory around Lake Bakal. Rebels also secure isolated pockets of resistance in portions of western Yakut. On February 11th of 2064, Korlinko passes away from liver cancer and Dimitria officially assumes the title of general secretary. However, this is where this happens. In March 15th of 2064, while visiting Novobrisk, Og Ognarev is killed by the dragon Borzami. These are some names, huh? Right? In a surprise attack against the Red Army forces. And this dragon is not very well known. He's known to frequent in the, the Siberian area and has... I was going to say, I don't think you've ever mentioned yeah, him before. He's, he's <laughs> pushed Zani. back. He's pushed back against the Red Army and the natives that uh, are in the Yakut area. But nobody has been able to establish firm communication with him mm. go figure as to why he just pops up does does some shit and then dragons off again for a little bit yes <laughs> okay exactly. fair it's fun to see a chill drag well chill in quotes uh. it's like hey, <laughs> i'm just gonna do my thing and then you know i'm just gonna like kind of fade into the background watch, watch shit's going on in the sixth world that doesn't sound like uh, something that somebody that's a fan of Seder Krupp would say, but that's uh, you know, being, a you little, know, being a little sussy over there tonight, Tyler. I'm just hey, saying. Hey, you know, <laughs> Seder Krupp and, and our Lofweir and Savior. Lofweir heard, heard what you said, man. He heard what you said. <laughs> no, no, no. no. I, I'm not sympathizing with... It's all part of the great plan, you see. Uh, I'm know. pretty sure you just said that Waffler can kick rocks. No, I, wait, pretty, huh? I heard you say Seder Krupp sucks butt. I don't, easy, back me up. Oof. I, I can't speak to that. Seder Krupp is kind and of a powerhouse. <laughs> <laughs> Oof, I will not okay. be slandered. <laughs> Dang. So a quick glance at Russia currently in the sixth world. They are technically a bureaucratic dictatorship. Okay, yeah, I think that's an accurate way to describe Russia at <laughs> most points of history. Uh, they have a population of about 144 million people, 79% which is human, 3% elf, 6% dwarf, 8% orc, 3% troll and 1% other. And 100% reason to remember the name. Hmm? Mm, mm. 
What's up? They also have an estimated 15% Facts. sinless population. What is uh what are Russia's feelings about metahumanity? I feel like that's a hmm. I'm so glad you asked. Ahem. So Russia would be considered ultra nationalist. Ultra. Yes. Russians are a proud people and generally look don't look too fondly on outsiders. Weird. Bigotry and racism are as problematic here as in North America or Japan. But among Russians, they revolve around ethnicity rather than metatype. A Russian troll may get stares in Moscow, but everyone will trust him more than a human Georgian or even worse, a Jew. Ah, Russia. Ah, Russia. You had to go there, didn't you? In the grand hierarchy of Russian bigotry, the Russians stand at the top. The next step down are European Slavs, like the Ukrainians, Belarusians, and Baltic peoples. Though not held in high regard, most Russians tolerate them. Below that are the ethnic minorities of the Caucasus regions, such as Georgians, Tartars, Armenians, and Chechens. Most Russians look on these with suspicion. The lowest of the low on the ethnic totem pole for the Russians are the Jews, who remain the scapegoats for everything wrong with Russia. Ironically, however, Jews hold some of the highest positions among extraterritorial corporations within Russian borders. So fuck the Russians, is basically what you're saying. <laughs> All that I'm saying is they're they're not well, looking too popular in this in the sixth world. <laughs> that's very fair. I mean, they're technically not looking so popular right now. I do well. that's very true. I, I do appreciate the irony of them being able to be like, Yeah, you don't like us? Well, uh, we fucking run everything, so <laughs> you know what? You're not sucks Russian. To, we don't like you suck, either. Buddy. <laughs> Uh, the National Supreme Soviet is the primary body politic of the Russian government. Similar to Parliament in Great Britain, the NSS appoints the ministers who run the various government agencies. A prime minister serves as the nominal head of state, but the office is primarily a figurehead, an office manager, the real power lies with the general secretary, a member of the NSS elected as the head of that body. The general secretary sets national policy, particularly in matters of national security and foreign relations. So in the sixth world, Russia has basically fallen back to its Soviet state ways. Some would say it never left. I mean... I, I suppose that's true. If you look at them nowadays, they're supposed to be a uh, what's a good political nomenclature for I was going to say, we're, we're <laughs> so far in the not not <laughs> not great camp at this point. Mm -hmm. uh, next, of course, we have what keeps helps keep all this in line, which is the Red Army. The Russian military holds a special place in many Russian hearts for defending the Russian motherland from invaders such as the Nazis and the Alliance for Allah. So it's not surprising that they're one of the major players in the National Supreme Soviet. I'm so glad that Russia in that world... You know, they're they're mm -hmm. taking care of Nazis. That's cool. Well, I mean, they did back in World War II, which is what they're referencing. Yeah. Yeah. It's just uh, okay. Cause I, I as as we all know, I'm the I'm the 
person who doesn't know what's happening outside of my own four walls <laughs> is the anti-semitism like how much of that is just drawn on real current russian like cultural uh, photos. like i don't i don't i don't know um i i would say it, it's fairly close with the ideal that most russians view other non-russians as beneath them that's something that Russia has always had, though, throughout its history. Not great. <laughs> well, military service is the sacred obligation of Russian citizens. I'm doing my part, comrade. <laughs> so reads the Constitution of the Russian Republic. Uh, real quick, just I did a little bit of research just because I uh, wanted to give Tyler some 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 accurate info for his question there mm -hmm. um in 2019 a research poll was done that found that 18 percent of russians hold unfavorable views of jews silver mm. lining that number had dropped from 34 percent in 2009 wait so okay, wait. Oh, 34 in 2009 18 percent in 2019 so that's still like well, it took 10 years a fifth of the population you could you could just let's just round up to be safe you know mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I, uh, and I say need to learn 20 percent of of russia as of 2019 according to the poll from 2019 unfavorable views so mm. um the consistency of anti-semitism in russia seems to be still there i wonder if it rises okay. because they go back to a national soviet mindset and government so do you think that it rises because of that because <sighs> this is getting history historically speaking mm -hmm. the jewish people have been placed as scapegoats because they've been seen as people that usually have lots of money or favor capitalism yeah mm -hmm. that's why yeah. i asked because the way that it was worded in this i was like hmm. Mm -hmm. so it makes me think that in the sixth world here when the Russian government reverts back to more of a Soviet era esque mm -hmm. governance. That, of course, that would follow suit. Yeah, that that would make a lot of sense. So that tracks. Yeah, yeah, that tracks. I mean, I, again, silver lining in terms of real reality history. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Twenty fourteen, Putin did make it illegal uh, to uh, be a Holocaust denier. So you know. At least that, at least he did that. Already making big waves. You know, it took until 2014, but, <laughs> but, at least there's that. Oh, jeez. It is so hard to joke about Putin being a cool guy. Oh. I did. He's, I, he is, he is the most live action James Bond villain that has ever existed <laughs> in the history of humanity. He is an absolute oh, no. monster and I'm never going to Russia. So I don't have any fear saying any of these things, but uh, yeah, man, fuck Putin. I think, I think we can all universally <laughs> agree on that stance personally. Uh, don't drink the soup. Just don't, don't drink, drink the soup. don't drink the borscht. <laughs> Check your vodka. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. <laughs> is that seal factory? Yeah, <laughs> I don't know if this wax seal is secondhand or not, but mm -hmm. I guess we'll see what happens. Uh, so if if you're in uh, Russia in the sixth world, then you can be conscripted into the Red Army at any time. But many see this as a sacred trust. I mean, if you're in Russia now, you can be conscripted into the army at any time. Mm -hmm. That's literally the issue that they're running into. Uh, Russian society is highly militarized, go figure, and more so than any other European nation. So in the sixth world, there's still ironmongers. Uh, the Red Army's favored candidate for the next general secretary is one Vladimir Denko. He is the retired marshal and hero of Euro Wars 2. A la Boogaloo. A, a la Boogaloo. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank during that books. during that struggle, Danko's corpse of 
under-equipped and exhausted troops not only repulsed the onslaught of overwhelming alliance for Allah forces at Starpulf, but destroyed the retreating remnants in a daring counterattack. This campaign earned Denko an unprecedented three Hero of the Russian Republic medals. Our hero. Unlike many other politicians in the NSS, Denko is a true Russian patriot motivated to serve the best interests of the Russian people. This stance has often brought him into conflict with various extraterritorial megacorps operating in Russia, particularly Seder Krupp. Hmm. Only his popularity has kept a Seder Krupp assassin from taking him out. Who knows what Lofware is actually planning against him should he ascend to be the general secretary. It's all coming up, Lofweir. Hmm. So the Red Army would be nothing without its intelligence organization known as the GRU. I'm not even going to attempt to pronounce it. No, I, I feel like the people came here to... Yeah, I'm pretty sure that's what we're here for, Easy. so... You know what? I'm going to take a moment and, and type it to you guys so you can okay. see what it is, so uh -huh. then you can be like, what? Ooh, so, ooh, so give me just a moment. Okay. Do you want to Do you want us to all give our best in, uh, yes. ability to yes. try to pronounce we, we, this? Yes. Give our best phrase. ability to try oh, to pronounce man. this phrase. I have, all right. I have a coworker who studied Japanese and Russian, and they wrote out a phrase and ex tried to explain it to me. And they were like, yeah, it's like six uh six what six consonants in a row or something like that. I'm Sick. like that is that's a so, lot. So after you say it, you have to you immediately need like a cough drop because you're just gonna destroy your throat trying to pronounce yeah. that. <laughs> and I was like, and, and and this was kind of fucked up for me to say, but I was like, they were saying this certain phrase, and I was like, it just sounds like I'm hearing someone speak backwards. Uh -uh. It's Russian is such an interesting language, let me tell you. It is aggressive. I think. They, also, <laughs> they also basically have their own made-up alphabet. Aren't That's very true. All alphabets made up, man. Yeah, that's also true. Well, you'll see some some uh consistency. Yeah, consistency or sharing across some of them. Uh, I feel like Russian is uniquely just Russian. Russian. You never see it anywhere That's else. That's true. Yeah, it doesn't really like derive from anything either. Like it, like a lot of other languages. Like you're like, oh, it's like ba like English is based off of a Latin core and stuff yeah. like that. Yeah, yeah. No, yeah. Russian is just fucking Russian, dude. Like, yeah. Russian <laughs> is Russian as fuck. Okay, there you go. I just sent it to you. Oh. Uh huh. And you want me to say that? Uh, yes, but um, awesome. You wanna you wanna take it a shot? What's a, oh? You want me to take first swing at it here? I, I mean, I you know it, whatever you want to do, man. Glavnoye razvidvertnoy upravleni. Honestly, that sounds pretty close. That sounds pretty good. Hey, um, comrades. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yep. Glavnoye razvedovetelnoye upravlenye. It's a lot of ye. It's a lot of years. Yeah. Glavnoye revlutetnoye help opravlenye. It's like a Russian usher, usher song. <laughs> a lot of years. This this hill we get the boots in the seats. <laughs> Uh, this I is pronunciation. And just Go ahead and wanna... try, I need but to just hear this. <laughs> Copy paste pronunciation. Uh, but that is their intelligence agency. Found that a lot of Russian pronunciation just comes down to being able to hit that accent. You know, you have to hit mm -hmm. that right yeah, thickness say, when it comes I didn't to saying Russian. Any inflection there, and it made me feel <laughs> yeah. weird. You have to like roll your R's. But yeah, but also like Tyler said, like it has to be monotone. Like there's mm -hmm. no like emotional inflection mm -hmm. when speaking Russian. Everything is very mm -hmm. factual and precise. <laughs> Matter of fact, it is a very cold and unforgiving language. 
<laughs> much like it's very cold and unforgiving <laughs> landscape. Yeah, much, much like Siberia in the winter is very <laughs> cold and unforgiving. You cannot... You must cuddle with bear to stay warm. If you cannot survive pronunciation, you cannot survive the winter. <laughs> it is it is so cold that your borscht will feel hot by comparison. It's how cold it is in Mother Russia. Uh, you, you guys will be happy to know that the GRU mm. appoints all political officers. Ooh, fun. I can see no conflict of interest there. With the uh, being the intelligence arm of the army, of course not. They no, have I'm sure it's our fine. best interests at heart, comrade. Ideological counselors assigned to a military unit to make sure the troops toe the party line, aka yes, commissar. Yep. They do it for them, yet they do for us. <laughs> A political officer can overrule a field commander if he feels the commander is a loose cannon. So yes, it is loose cannon. Just a commissar. <laughs> you I didn't just... say good morning to the general secretary <laughs> poster hold that is up in the mess hall. <laughs> Death. Death for you. You did not salute statue of grand leader on the way in. Seems good. like capitalism to me. <laughs> you, you did not say good night to me, comrade. You are loose cannon. <laughs> <laughs> I did not get customary kiss on the forehead with warm glass of milk. What is deal? <laughs> what are we? I thought we were cool, but now you're making it weird. You're giving me weird vibes, comrade. I'm getting mixed signals. <laughs> <laughs> I love insecure commissar. <laughs> <laughs> so true you typed in ha ha instead of lol what this means you said that we were going to just stay casual but then you keep texting me at three in the morning uh, and then of course we have <laughs> the russian special forces also known as the spetsnaz I'm glad that the Spetsnets have stayed consistent, you know? I, I, I feel like they'd have to. Like, they're one of the most, like, culturally known special mm -hmm. forces, right? Like, if you watch any action movies from the 80s or 90s, they're when, the they're try guys. when they're trying to get over how much of a badass somebody is, they go, oh, man, he was trained by the Spetsnets. Yeah. And he made it out alive? Mm -hmm. That son of a bitch. Yeah, it it's like... <laughs> yeah, man, it's... So yes, they are Good the for them. legendary special forces that sure have the, the same reputation as the Green Berets of the would be Yukos military now, or the Wildcats of the Man. Meow. Meow. Seriously, <laughs> don't mess with Wildcats. Meow. Uh, according to Russian military doc. And Spetsnaz forces deploy deep into enemy territory to strike high-value targets such as command centers, airfields, and nuclear stockpiles, creating divisionary terror attacks to confuse and distract enemy leaders. Is their secondary mission because of their secretive nature and missions? The Spetsnaz fall under the exclusive command of the GRU. The GRU? Yeah, the one that we just oh, had yes, yes, military yes, yes, intelligence. Yes, yes. So yes. nothing like having your commissars in control of your special forces. Woo! Who also yes. appoint all political uh, mm -hmm. powers and positions within the government. Whoop. Definitely nothing wrong here. <laughs> Best interests at heart, comrade. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. R G R U. <laughs> Uh, this feels like it hits too close to home, but um, or current events, I should say. No, many, what? many Shut people up. also, yeah, many people also believe the GRU has a Spetsnaz cell nested in the Rhine Ruhr Megaplex in Germany, and one in Constantinople. The not latter, Istanbul. Not Istanbul. That's nobody's business, but the Turks. Mm, the latter mostly to keep an eye on the Ukrainians and the Straits. Of Bosporus. Yeah, that checks out. Gotta watch those Ukrainians. Whoa. Whoa. I, whoa. I guess. Whoa, whoa, wee, whoa. When Do was we, 
Do we? I was telling you that's that's <laughs> where they're crossing very close what? into current real world events. When when written? Uh, not... When when written written when? I mean, to be fair, like Russia's always. Specifically, Putin's always wanted Ukraine. Like that's mm, this is this is very true. That's this true. is this is a current, uh, you know, reality and everything to the Ukrainians. Man, those dudes are fucking badasses. Uh, so this one but... is one of the the newer versions. This is ah. all coming from uh, Shadows of Asia, which was copyright two thousand five. <laughs> I still thought you were going to be yeah. like, this is one of the more recent ones, copyrighted 1997. <laughs> we're definitely not saying anything about the uh, progress of uh, Shadowrun writing and uh, the lack of content. Uh, mm. or, uh, right, right. Russian? That can't be it. Uh, the next uh, influential body in the Russian political machinations is one called the UGB. The Upright Gittigan's Brigade. Oh, Gittigan's Brigade. If only. Gittigan's. The Directorate of State Security is the latest incarnation of the infamous secret police that have terrorized Russians since the time of the SARS. Oh, yeah, that's not good. As masters of information on everything that takes place inside and sometimes outside of russia the ugb used that power to blackmail certain nss members to vote in their favor again checks so out U and UGB uh, is, makes is sense. basically the reincarnation of the kgb i was waiting to hear about the kgb they are now the ugb ah doesn't have the same ring to it yeah it doesn't sound well i mean I, I feel like that's intentional, you know, on point branding because like, branding, mm -hmm. yes, doesn't sound as evil, you know, <laughs> it doesn't sound as evil as the KGB, but it's still not great. Uh, they are currently run, or they have a uh, a name in the ring for the next general secretary, Victor Camden. It's always a victor. Uh, his primary achievement was his systematic operation to eliminate the Der Nacht Mansion Poly Club sometime around 2045. Not the Poly Club? I don't. Who are the Poly Club? It's the Nachtmann. It's a German Poly Club. Oh, okay. What's a Poly Club? <laughs> Like a political. Oh, okay. Ah, of that, course. Okay. Okay. <laughs> well, that makes more sense. Easy. Why didn't you just say that? Jeez. They call them poly clubs in the sixth world. What do you want from me? <laughs> to to make more sense. Oh, I'm sorry. Bald <laughs> question. What's a club? <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh boy. Follow up to that follow up. What are politics? <laughs> like, if you could just uh, real quick, real quick, let's do real politics. quick over under. When, like, question mm. when you say world, like, like give roundabouts, what does that mean? You know? <laughs> <laughs> Where exactly? <laughs> Where am I? Uh, you'll be happy to know that uh, Seder Krupp also has some political clout in russia and what? they're pushing yeah pushing one of their own candidates for general secretary one dmitry bychik ah uh, yes dmitry i know him well <clears throat> mm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and then uh finally one of the other players that is in the ring running for the new general secretary position after their most recent general secretary was unfortunately met the breath end of a dragon. Oops. Uh, the other player is one Anastasia Beckferenda, who is head of department K which is domestic uh -oh. intelligence. Oh, wow. They just repurposed the K? Or is that a 
just a, a thing. I think so. I think so. In the past department, Kay has taken kickbacks from the Vori to look the other way while the mobsters go about their dirty business. Fun. Uh, the K in KGB in Russian stands for commandant, which is committee. So K can oh, just committee. it'll just be slotted in for uh, I think general purposes and a lot of uh, acronyms when it mm. comes to Russia. <laughs> and then what is the the what was the U? Did we did we uh when for were, when, for the UGB? Yeah. Uh, that's easy. Did we know what the acronym stand for for you the uh, a second I'm looking for it right now? Yeah, no problem. Yeah, there's something about the letter K that's like it's a menacing letter, man. It's a menacing letter. I mean, within the context of the United States alone, you put three of them in a row, you're having a bad time. So you're having a real bad time. <sighs> okay. It's a, another lovely long Russian. I'm cool. Dick. It's basically supposed to mean Directorate of State Security. Ah, so it's a okay. committee. But so it's it's called it's called Upravlian Gustrasnavni Bestoponsti. Bespastnosti. That was Sorry. one word? Yes. Well, it's three. It's three words. Oh, okay. I was gonna say Russian is intense, yo. Yes, upravlian gustor sensvnoy bezopostnasti. So yes, it's supposed to be Directorate of State Security or UGB, the Foreign Intelligence Agency. Next on our list of Russian acronyms. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I was going to say, I apologize to our Russian listeners, but I feel like at this point, they're gone. <laughs> <laughs> they're if so you've, gone. If we you've have, made it to this point in the episode, duh, comrade. Duh. Mm, <laughs> we have the MVD. The Motor Vehicle Division? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> no. This oh, is Russia's yeah. primary law enforcement agency. Oh. While the UGB the, the serves... The Manpower Violence Division. <laughs> While the UGB serves as the secret police, the NVD <laughs> is its public enforcement division. Oh, it enforces I'm, the public, all I'm right. I'm sorry. Can we... Ha have we ever... If we haven't, we need a wrestling faction that's called the Violence Division. <laughs> I don't care what goes in front, but Violence Division sounds amazing. Oh, dude, and have them dress up like Joy Division. Oh my so they, god. So they all come out and they're just like really nerdy looking wrestling <laughs> characters. And then they get in the ring and they just beat the shit out of you. Mm -hmm. Oh my god. And then you could have multiple names for finishers. You could have like divide and conquer or <laughs> divide by zero like come on jeez <laughs> i call this by... in 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 when they have a um a tag team match has got to be uh, three of them so they can pull their ultimate move pythagorean theorem oh <laughs> they're a bunch of nerds <laughs> They'll Look, kick your ass. Tyler, <laughs> huh? violence division is what we would have gotten if the BCC was formed by Seth Rollins oh instead of God. Dean Ambrose. <laughs> for those in the know. For those in the know, that one's for you. The BCC, yeah, you know me, you know. Violence <laughs> division, coming, coming soon. <laughs> so, yeah. unlike many of the Western law enforcement agencies, the MVD runs its own military branch known as the Interior Army. While the Red Army mainly deals with outside threats, the Internal Army assumes a lot of homeland security duties, such as securing <laughs> national <Duty>. food <laughs> and oil reserves, guarding public institutions like power stations and municipal buildings, and quelling internal revolts and riots. With bullets. Yes, with bullets. The Interior Army also runs the infamous Gulag prison camps, which still exist no matter how loudly the
the National Supreme Soviet denies it. No, no, we don't have we don't have gulag prison. No. Uh, if Stranger Things has taught me anything, uh, it is that they absolutely do. Mm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. <laughs> and they have pay per view level content where an an otherworldly monster fights like seven of them after they had a really <laughs> in a gladiatorial <laughs> death. Gladiatorial death. Gladiatorial my favorite ring. thing about oh that God. entire thing is that they just like voluntarily give them weapons, and they're like, "Yeah, I don't know, try to kill it. Fuck it, we're on an yeah. experiment." Yeah, <laughs> we want it to be some so good. Fun. Yeah, so spoilers. Ridiculous. I guess. Oh my God. <laughs> Uh, when the Yakut seceded from Russia in the in the 2030s, the Interior Army assumed a leading role in that conflict because the Moscow government considered it an internal revolt. Uh, after a few years of stalemate, the Interior Army had to swallow its pride and bring in the Red Army. And currently in Russia, many Red Army forces are being rotated into Interior Army uh locations and taking over so it's like the interior army is slowly being replaced at its job they take our military jobs they took our military jobs well really i mean you'll just go join the red army because it's your national civic duty i'm ready this comrade Mm mm-hmm now, let me put on my commissar hat and make sure that you're doing your best civic duty. <laughs> uh, but what is a nation without criminals, right? And in Russia... Uh, peaceful, sorry. That was the answer to your question. Oh, well. <laughs> sorry, this is the sixth world. There's criminal organizations everywhere. Oh, And no. in Russia, we have the Vori. I bet I know what they're into. After the fall of the Soviet organized Union. crime. What did you think I was going to say, Tyler? Yeah, seriously. Um, lore meat. Mm. <laughs> lore meat. They deal in lore meat exclusively. <laughs> mm-hmm. uh... After the fall of the Soviet Union, the Vori syndicates moved quickly to carve their niche in Russia's power dynamics. Mm. You could say that they consumed their competition. They did. Mm. Thank you for the four joke. It's a hard pill to swallow, but swallow they shall. Oh, God. <laughs> uh, they took advantage of Russia's reopening to move westward through newly liberated Eastern Europe and into the European Union. Up until now, the Vori have primarily been fighting the Alta Commission in Europe, so the Vori are fighting with the Italians. Uh, which has provided a strong defense against Vori incursion. Uh, I mean, however, if you're gonna if you're gonna try to go if you're gonna try to take over anywhere, like Italy's a good place to go because you you know that they're gonna taste the best, right? <laughs> oh, that's spicy, so spicy. <laughs> uh, however, with the power scramble at home following the general secretary's death. The Vori has an opportunity to strengthen their position in Russia. This has put the Vori in a quandary as should they consolidate power at home and lose ground to the Alta Commission or fight the mafia influence abroad and get outmaneuvered at home or should they divide their efforts and make little headway in either direction. Well, you know, the thing about the Vori is that they've always had an eye for politics, but a stomach for negotiation. Mm. <sighs> so bad. <sighs> and I course... appreciate your genius, Austin. I see you. <laughs> and of course, the Vori is not just one organization. There are different branches. There is the Moscow Vori, the St. Petersburg Vori, uh, the Vladis Vostok Vori, and all of them bring different ideals to what the overall body of the organized crime organization should do and where they should be focused. Hmm. So you're saying that every branch of the Vori have very distinguished and specified opinions about the body. Mm, yes. I see. Okay. Interesting. Mm-hmm. You're asking the tough questions. He really is. The these 
questions of where to get the most delicious lore cuts from Word? these uh, Vori partitionates. Word. Ah, Tyler, you'll enjoy this part. This is all about Seder Crunt. Ooh, do tell. Well, last year, the last year wasn't good for Seder Krupp in Russia. What? The Megacorp had once held a dominant position, but was recently seen its power eroding as Yamatetsu has moved into the area and it stalks its fellow Megacorp like a Siberian tiger. But it's okay. Um, well, the re- one of the reasons, other than Yamatetsu having moved in the area, uh, Seder Krupp's other main rival, one Zeta Imp Kem, recently scored significant victories in the Russian business sector. Most likely because they're toting the party line. And then Lofweir's right claw man as chief of uh. Cedar Krupp Prime, one Rolf Berman, went AWOL in Moscow for a few days in 2062. And that disappearance has yet to be explained. Uh, what? Wait, okay. So. So that person just disappeared for a few days? Mm-hmm. With no explanation. And then came back and never, ever said what happened? Yes. Huh. Hmm. You know, it might just be the proximity to a recent episode, but... um. <laughs> and, and, you know, if we, we're going to get into it later, that's cool, but I've yet to hear about any possible bug spirits in Russia... I mean, remember, we we did say that at one point, the Universal Brotherhood did have a chapter in Moscow. Oh. So are you saying that there's a good chance that Lawflayer is just a bug spirit at this point? No, there's not a good chance that Lawflayer is a bug spirit. Oh, okay. How dare you? That is far from possible. (laughs) Damn right it is. I mean, it would just, it would make him cooler, but that's fair, I guess. What? Oh, man. Jeez. So for the most part, Seder Krupp's influence is concentrated around the Caucasus Mountains and the lower stretches of the Volga River. The Volga River? Is that what you said? Volga. Volga. Oh, I just assumed since we were at the Caucasus Mountains. Of course. Thank you. And there it is, ladies and gentlemen, Shadowrun After Dark. Uh, Savior Krupp's primary interest in Russia revolves around the heavy industry and natural resources, particularly oil. It hasn't it always? <laughs> it has. The oil pipeline from Kaska Pass through this region en route to tankers in Rostov on the Black Sea coast. So Savior Krupp has a vested interest in protecting those pipelines. Unfortunately, those same pipelines are frequent targets of sabotage by eco-terrorists and by Chechen and Crimean uh, partisans fighting Russian occupation. So not only does Seder Krupp have to defend the pipeline from eco-terrorists, but also from Chechen and Crimean rebels. Uh, Seder Krupp has nominated its own candidate for general secretary of the Russian party. Uh, one Dmitry Bayashek, a party official that is from Solmensk, which is a Seder Krupp factory town. And Dmitry has served on the city council before being promoted up the ranks to the Supreme Soviet. In terms of politics, Bayacek doesn't carry a lot of prestige or sway, but he's a gifted policy worker. The Supreme Soviet is a hell of a title. (laughs) Mm -hmm. It really is. (laughs) I thought that was just a rank. (laughs) It's just a title, you know? Soviet Supreme, Soviet Imperator. (laughs) Soviet Imperator. Warlord Soviet. Oh, stop. That's, that's <laughs> That sounds cool now. I hate it. <laughs> Can't be um, having that. Well, it sounds like you need to report to your nearest commissar, comrade. Uh-oh. Uh, 
We mentioned the other company that is a thorn in Zeta Krupp's side, one Zeta Impchem. During the resource rush, the British company ICI made its entry into Russia when it bought out a newly privatized ore refinery, uh, used this to firmly establish itself in the Russian business world, and it became Zeta Impchem after merging with another corporation. It used its newfound muscle to buy the loyalty of several Russian politicians who passed laws favorable to Zeta Impchem and made it an indeniable part of Russia's political landscape. How about that? You know, who would have thought? <laughs> they said it couldn't be done. Zeta Impchem primarily concentrates on the industrial side of the chemical industry. Uh, what side of the chemical industry? Oh, industrial. Sorry, is what in, you said. In, right. Yeah, completely industrial. Oh, okay. Well, I mean, at least it's not weaponized. <laughs> sure, it's not. <laughs> well, on paper, air quotes. <laughs> They've also branched out into other forms of materials development and production, such as mining and metallurgy, taking advantage of local expertise in working specialty non-ferrous metallic alloys such as titanium, osmium, and platinum. And then finally, as the other megacorp player in Russia, you have Yamatetsu, who moved their corporate offices from Japan. When did Yama move from Japan? Uh, Yamatetsu moved into Japan in 2059. Oh, huh. 2059, Yamatetsu relocates. Mostly because when the chairman of the board of Yamatetsu dies from a fatal stroke, it passes to his son, Yuri. And because Yuri is an orc, his ascension to the board brought heated opposition from corporate headquarters. Because Japan don't like that metahumanity. So he decided, I'll go to Russia, who loves veterans. <laughs> <laughs> to, to overcome it, Yuri moved Yamatetsu headquarters lock, stock, and barrel from Kyoto to Russia. Oh. <laughs> he was just like, screw you guys, I'm taking my toys and going elsewhere. I guess. It's just funny to me that he's like, hey, you guys are a little racist over here. You know where I'm going to go? Russia. <laughs> where it's not nearly as racist. Uh... <laughs> it's just racist in different ways. It was kind of racist. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you know what? You're you're one of the cool kinds of racists. Like, huh? <laughs> uh, in, in, in an effort to increase its its stature in Russia, Yamatetsu is backing a candidate for the general secretary position. One Sonia. Nikhalana, <laughs> a former cosmonaut and technical consultant. <laughs> I'm sorry, I, I'm just, I've held up on <laughs> Russia's like the, you know, when he has too much to drink at a party, he starts to say some shit, but other than that, <laughs> he's a cool guy. Like, oh you know, he doesn't gosh. really feel that way, but, you know, oh. you get a couple of vodkas in him, and it's just, you know, mm. he starts you know, saying he's some a stuff. Cool guy. <laughs> You know, the real villain is PC culture, Tyler. Oh my god. Oh I'm my just god. so woke now. <laughs> god. Like, nobody's ever heard a joke, man. Like, go jig it easy. Oh I, my god. Oh no. I was like, I don't know what stuff I'm going to say. This is going to get bleeped out. No, it's fine. All of this is said in the name of comedy, ladies and gentlemen. Yeah. To make that clear. I just, I thought that was funny because it it's is like, very funny. He, he's not that racist. You know, like, dude, dude, dude I feel like, okay. <laughs> this is not for the podcast, but that is so, uh, uh so. It's, a, it, it's close to you know, home, right? It's okay. I know that it's feeling. okay. He's not that racist. <laughs> he's from a different age. He's from, yeah, a, he's from different a different time. time. He's a really nice guy. You know, he may. Oh, God. you just don't know how he, he was brought up. You know, it was a oh, different man. time, man. Like he just, he just needs. 
He just needs a friend of color to <laughs> de-racist him. Oh. I can fix him. Okay, that we're gonna have to talk about that. I don't know pod. if you know this, but his favorite movie is The Legend of Bagger Vance. Oh. So, <laughs> was, oh, yeah, I'm definitely gonna have to tell you about this sometime. Easy. Oh my god. Okay. Uh moving on. Uh, hey, you know, however, wait, however much thing. of that gets left in. I'm good. Yeah, I was gonna say. <laughs> dude, she got it, dude. You, you know, hot take of the episode. You know, I really like me some lore meat, but you know what I don't like racism. Anyway, Facts. Russia. Facts. Wow, what a hot <laughs> Tyler. You're Russia. so brave. You know, Tyler. <laughs> Tyler, how could you say something so controversial yet so brave? I really just <laughs> easily. I really just want to take a round a moment, not only for a round of applause, but also yeah, that what he said. Like in case <laughs> it needs stating. Yeah, you know, weird. Indeed, I. This is this is the kind of gifts I'm bestowed by the great lawfare <laughs> eternal this, campaign. This is very true. There mm. you go. I. You know what? There had to be some silver lining, right? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I'm gonna have to snap this picture and send it to you of this uh, this image of this orc that they have here in, in Russia that looks like he's definitely got to be a KGB agent. <laughs> <laughs> I will send it. it to you later. He... A KGB agent troll, orc. Oh, a KGB. He's got oh, he's got the you know he's got the rim glasses and he's smoking the cigar and he's got the cheap suit with the the typical trench coat that's pulled over it. Are you sure you're not just describing someone from the violence division? Because <laughs> <laughs> that's true. Do they Sounds have familiar? Do... Do they have like a bleach tipped swoop haircut or do they have like the side shave fuckboy haircut? Uh, what, they, what are we dealing with here? They are bald. Oh, wow. My God. <laughs> yeah, damn it. That's yeah, why I said KGB. He's probably KGB. Yeah, he's probably. Yeah, makes sense. <laughs> if you have no hair, they cannot grab it and fight. You, you cannot be <laughs> grabbed in fight. <laughs> um, but uh, Yamatetsu's. <laughs> Yamatetsu's candidate for uh, general secretary their claim to fame is in the 2040s for their explorations of the dark side of the moon like they invested heavily in pink floyd albums or no like she she was a cosmonaut and they oh they did the exploration on the dark side of the moon oh did they just find a big inflatable floating pig on that side no, they did not <laughs> damn it <laughs> Although that would have been funny, right? <laughs> it would have been ironic if the Russians were the ones to find it. Was mm. what it would have been. Mm-hmm. Ah, that's a lot of Russian politics and sure is. machinations behind them, which is part of the big draw for Russia at this time. Is they're still trying to uh, get that general secretary spots filled. I believe it ends up being. I'm checking to see who it actually is. In I'll have to look through and see if I can find who actually becomes the general secretary by the 2080s, because there's no way that it can remain vacant for that long. <laughs> or can it? Uh, I hope not. <laughs> That'd be terrible. <laughs> Just like, you know, we just couldn't find the time to have an election. Have yeah, an election, just a yeah, giant yeah. power vacuum that's going on. For how many years? 20. For 20 years, you know. Huh. I mean, huh. I guess it really it makes you happen. think, huh? It's probably nothing. Probably. Yeah, there's no correlations to this one. Yeah, I don't know what to tell you. I just, you know, our government military branch that's supposed to elect our politicians for us they just haven't they just haven't said <laughs> yeah, it's weird just really yeah. busy. you know i wrote them a letter they said we're gonna look into it and uh 20 years later still looking into it next question <laughs> <laughs> moving right along <laughs> so uh russia is is a big country it spans five time zones so what are the important places that we should be looking at well, obviously, so we spend there's... five time zones too easy. What are you trying to say? <sighs> USA, well, USA, 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 USA. USA. Uh, no, we don't. 
It's the sixth world. We don't span five time zones anymore. No, we do. <laughs> Here in real world America. Where easy. Shatter and end in reality begin, man. Mm. It's always the question. Away, man. It's always the question. Easily, it's where the Nan took their lands back. Well, that's fair. Damn, and then the U- and then and then really? the Yukos and the Kos um, split the up. The fucking separate, breaks, man. So, uh, Why you gotta get real, dude? Yeah, you're talking about California Free State. California Free State. You, you know, talk- California Free State kind of just becomes California Free State, and no one cares, and they have really the worst time in the sixth world. <laughs> it's true, but also they're like the majority of the Pacific time code uh, time zone. So. Mm-hmm. I mean, they lose they lose the lower portion back to, or they lose part of the lower portion back to the Nan. They then get invaded by the Japanese. And yeah, the northern and they take San part get, <laughs> Yeah, then the northern part gets invaded by the new elf nation of the tier. Oops. So it's just like they're having the worst time. <laughs> But their real estate market is booming. Oh, I bet. <laughs> oh, God. So, uh, Moscow is obviously an important mm. place in Russia. That's pretty cool. Uh, right now, in the 2060s, though, Moscow's shadows are hotter than a forger's fire. It's pretty hot. Uh, except for most of the megacorps, particularly every faction vying for power has a headquarters in Russia's capital. Shadowrunners here are more layered with intrigue than the most intricate of the Russian those uh, Russian dolls. Mm. You know, the, mm-hmm. the ones the like, nesting dolls, the mm-hmm. nesting dolls. Yes, mm-hmm. yes. I think that's what it's called. What? Matroshkas or something? Yeah, Matroshkas. In addition to the current controversy surrounding the general secretary's post. The Russian national capital also invites plenty of international espionage. With the fragmentation of North America putting additional separation between the Yukos and Russia, Russia's top spy rivalry has moved to Great Britain's intelligence services. As MI6... And I was the say. GB maneuver their agents around Red Square in an international game of political chess. I'm glad that MI6 is still around. Yeah, well, now they're the big intelligence service to compete with since the U.S. doesn't have the CIA anymore. That's fair. I mean, MI6 has always sounded the most like a spy agency ever, though, right? Like, KGB's mm-hmm. up there pretty well. as They're, like, pretty high up there as well, but... MI6 is like, what do they do? Espionage. What do you think they do? Like mm-hmm, mm-hmm. with a name like MI6? Come on now. Uh the the other player in this spy game happens to be Imperial Japan. Mm. So UGB agents have to contest with ninjas. Oh snap. Corporate ninjas. But mostly probably James Bond types. Clearly. Clearly. Uh, during the winter months are some of the most horrible times to be in Russia and be a shadow runner. I've never heard that before. Oh, of course not, right? November this is news or to me. December. <laughs> the sun sets early as three in the afternoon and sometimes doesn't rise until after nine in the morning. The snow and ice also makes it hard for vehicles and drones to get around. Reference back to our uh antarctica episode about uh ice and snow and how that wreaks havoc yeah it's not a good time across the board no the next most important place that you'll get to in russia is saint petersburg Mm -hmm. known as leningrad during the cold war saint petersburg is. is russia's primary port on the baltic sea St. Petersburg mimics many historical cities of old Europe. Shadowrunners used to working the streets of Paris, Brussels, or London should feel right at home in St. Petersburg. Oh, so they've made it into more of like a metropolitan city? Mm-hmm. In, in a la the European style? It makes sense if, they're, if that is their main port of entry, especially yes. to connect with Europe. 
As the second largest city in Russia, the largest Baltic seaport, St. Petersburg holds offices and factories for all the AAA megacorps, as well as the major Eurocorp players. St. Petersburg is also a Russian Navy stronghold and site of the Baltic Fleet headquarters. So if you're doing pulling a lot of runs in Russia, you're most likely in St. Petersburg. I mean, to be honest, I'd rather be there than Moscow. It would be as popular, probably about as popular as Seattle. I mean, you've got all of the AAA mega corporations there. Mm -hmm. You've got access to, uh, to the Baltic Sea. So honestly, shadow runners from Seattle would probably feel pretty at home in St. Petersburg. It's fair. Uh, in addition to the Navy, the Russian Orthodox Church, which is the major religion in Russia, is also a force in the city. While the church wages its political battles in Moscow, the academic battles take place in St. Petersburg. Many museums and libraries are sponsored by the church, which gives them privileged access to some of the church's vaults, archives, and repositories. Speculation is that given the close ties between the church and the St. Petersburg museums, lots of people agree that the Russian Orthodox Church has a secret treasure vault like the Vatican's, full of forbidden lore, holy relics, and other trinkets. How many spears of Longulus does St. Petersburg have? <laughs> that's, that's my question. Maybe it has the original. I knew it. <sighs> the next city on our russian vacation tour mm. oh yeah is that what we're calling this now okay mm -hmm. <laughs> fair okay <laughs> uh kronstadt sitting a few dozen kilometers from saint petersburg on the island of colton the anarchist city of kronstadt serves as a stark contrast to russia's authoritarian regime Originally a military base, the soldiers and sailors stationed on the island mutinied, motivated by years of resentment for poor supplies and frustration over the incompetent top brass in the European campaign. After repelling several Russian government attempts to retake the island, Kronstadt became a haven for polyclubbers, mobsters, dissidents, smugglers, and others seeking to escape from Russian repression. It's basically Tortuga. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, if you're a Shadowrunner, this is a hangout spot. But with less shanties, I'm sure. Mm, much less shanties. Much it's it's, it's got to be very cold, so. Criminally, a criminal lack of shanties. Uh, still, almost 30 years later, Kronstadt remains as anarchist as ever. A loose council of engineers and administrators keeps the infrastructure running, but otherwise everyone goes their own way, bound only by the implicit understanding that between the Russians and the corpse, they either all hang together or they all hang separately. Smuggling is the main cash cow, though people can also make good money passing around black information the akula the renegade russian submarine crews defend the island from russian and corporate reprisals when they're not out hunting for money targets as undersea pirates yar so i was right tortuga it is except instead of ships they have submarines oh. parts of the caribbean with submarines hell yeah <laughs> Pirates oh, of the Caribbean, wait. Russian with submarines. Yeah, I was gonna say it. It almost makes the scene where all the pirate zombies are walking underwater kind of useless, mm -hmm. kind of super useless actually, because it's just there's it's just pirates walking on the seabed, and then there's just also a submarine, and then a submarine just rolls by, <laughs> torpedo at them or some shit. Guys, it's, it's uh, what 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 you're discussing here is the hunt for red pearl. Right? That's, oh, that's where it is. Mm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I support it. 
Uh, More again. Russian underwater pirates, please. <laughs> Tyler, again, you'll be happy to know that uh, the only corporation on the island is Seder Krupp. I have my hands up in the, like, what did I tell you? Kind of pose right now. <laughs> so they're all a bunch of criminals, is what you're saying, easy. They're all just a bunch of low lives. Well, it's, an, it's bunch it's of a no completely are. Uh, it's a complete city run by anarchists. So I don't know. Hey, you want some cool news about it though? Do I need to put on a jacket? All uh, news. Oh, crap is cool news. <laughs> no, this is cool news about Kronstadt specifically, okay. <laughs> and, and more so about the Akula sub pirates. Okay, that's uh -huh. a just a cool title, right? Akula sub pirates. So, uh, there's a gang war that's brewing in the Baltic between the Akula sub pirates and the Viking gangs out of Sweden. Are they okay. tired of having their longboats raided by submarines? I, I suppose that they are. <laughs> <laughs> that's Is my things. assumption of what's happening out there? I don't know. The Vikings engage mostly in smuggling, but lately they've been expanding into piracy and trespassing into Akula hunting waters. So mm. you've got Vikings versus sub pirates. All you need to do is throw in some robots, and I feel like you've got a sci fi movie. That is an insane concept. Tyler, you mentioned uh, hot dogs and fan fiction, uh, the uh -huh. sweet lore meat. I feel like <laughs> we are getting dangerously close. <laughs> this is like, this is some prime cut lore, right? <laughs> the marbling on this lore is, mm. Yeah, this is this is some Wagyu lore right now. This is some Wagyu lore. This is this is some A4 grade fucking this is lore some right now, dude. Free lore, except it's Ooh. very cruel. <laughs> <laughs> Just because of the topic material, it's absolutely. Cruel. Uh, so we leave the island this... of anarchy and the cool sub pirates. Now we are heading to Nisni Novograd, known as Gorky. During the Cold War. Little Gorky. Novogrod is the is Russia's third largest city and sits squarely in the heart of European Russia. At the intersection of the Oka and Volga rivers, Novogrod serves as Russia's crossroads, easily accessible from St. Petersburg in the north to the Black Sea in the south. During the Cold War, it served as the center of Soviet military research and production. But after the Cold War, most of those facilities were privatized and converted to civilian endeavors. The Mega Corps snapped up most of the privatized facilities during the resource rush, with Zeta Imp Chem being the biggest winner. Most of Z Inc.'s Operations revolve around industrial chemicals and chemical products, and emissions from Z Inc.'s smokeless chimney stacks have given the city its notorious sunset purple haze. That sounds dope. Only if they played the song every evening as well. Right. <laughs> purple haze. No, that's purple rain, my friend. That's purple rain. Yeah. I know, I know. That the joke was. <sighs> that they play it every night so they use a different song but they put the, the words over it it's almost 2 a.m here you know <laughs> 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 uh, you'll be you know happy. what i you know what i like that concept more if we could have purple haze played every day but it's actually just different songs <laughs> but they put in the words purple haze <laughs> fair enough You'll also be happy to know that Zeta Impkem isn't the only mega corporation in this area. There's also Shiawase as technology and Renraku. Mm. Uh, Shiawase's presence is particularly notable in addition to facilities owned by Shiawase Atomics. Shiawase inherited several facilities previously owned by Fuchi. And uh, they run and maintain a local radiological lab. So nothing nefarious is going on there. 
or is it? I mean, what? Trying to make atomic material? What? 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 Come on. Couldn't be me. Definitely not happening. Now let's get in our beat up, our beat up car and head on over to Volgograd. This is formerly Stalingrad. Volgograd sits on the Volga River in southwestern Russia. This industrial city, lying relatively close to the Turkish Stan border, also serves as front headquarters for Red Army forces in the region. Seder Krupp maintains a strong presence here, guarding its oil pipelines that run from the Caspian oil fields to the refineries and tankers on the Black Sea. Heavy industry isn't the only moneymaker in Volgograd. The past few years have seen a, a large surge in archaeological expeditions sponsored primarily by Seder Krupp. Most of the expeditions focus on the region between the Black Sea and the Volga, and many also extend westward into parts of Ukraine and Moldova. The foundation the Atlantean Foundation also is pushing for some of these expeditions. And they have sent them into the Caucasus Mountains. However, harassment by ethnic partisans has delayed many projects. Some of those partisans being mem maybe members of the Cult of the Dragon, who have popped up in the region around Volgograd. Just maybe. I mean, just maybe. In the past couple of months, unexpected mana storms have hit the area. And we remember those from the mm. good old Australian episode. Their intensity varies. Sometimes it's nothing more than a light astral drizzle. Other times the storms erupt with killer ferocity. The storms tend to move around the region. They started somewhere in Ukraine on the Black Sea coast and have wandered eastward into Russia, then back into Ukraine, then back into Russia, and so on. The Russian government is downplaying the storms as, quote, minor disruptions, but secretly they are worried that they could end up with something like Sydney. What's the worst that could happen with a Sydney, too? Man, a storm boogaloo. <laughs> <laughs> Moving right along, we come to Novobrisk as the largest Russian city east of the Urals. It has become the provincial capital for what's left of Siberian Russia after they got kicked out. This is the front line for Russia's standoff against the Yakut. And the, arm, the area is crawling with Red Army, Interior Army, and UGB border guards. Finally making it all the way over to Yamatetsu's new headquarters in Vladivostok, Russia. Sitting on the Pacific Ocean, it has become a lot more visible on the world scene in recent years. It's headquarters for the Russian Pacific Fleet. Vladivostok has also been home to Yamatetsu since 2059. It is a hilly town of winding streets, sometimes referred to as the San Francisco of the East, has started to gain a reputation rivaling that of the Seattle Metroplex. In many ways, Vladivostok is a Russian version of Seattle, a modern frontier town on the Pacific Rim where multiple cultures merge. The sprawl is a mixture of Muscovite, Korean, Chinese, and Siberian ethnics, along with a large influx of metahumans fleeing persecution from Japan. There's plenty of work for everyone's taste, whether smuggling Telesma from Yakut, spying on Yamatetsu or the Russian Navy, or getting caught up in the mob wars between the Vori and Triads. So yeah, sounds just like a, a Seattle of the East. Except in facts. Seattle, in Seattle, you have the mob and the Yakuza. Yeah, right. <laughs> Here we have like what the Vori and the Vori and the Triads. Triads. 
You know that the you know the warrior you're hungry for justice. <laughs> Your justice. Oh boy, are they? They just can't get enough. Serve them up a slice of that humble pie. They're literally taking a bite out of crime. Mm. And fi- finally, we come to the newly formed Yakut, <laughs> the Yakut Nation called the Call of the Wild. That's the name of the nation. It's Yakut Call of the Wild. That's what's that's what it's referred to as. Because nature has reclaimed the land. This is most of Siberia, by the way. I mean, did the estate of Jack London try to sue them or anything? Or is they just, <laughs> is just, is they're just cool with it? Or? They're they're pretty cool with it because they you know, they haven't you know reclaimed it with their military. Uh, with their military might, so that's got to say something about whatever's defending the Yakut. Ah, uh, fair, yeah. An old Russian proverb, uh, I can't believe I'm going to do this, it says, Volkov boyatsa vizlesnit kodit, which translates to, if you're afraid of wolves, don't go into the woods. Solid advice. 12 out of 10. That checks out. And perhaps the Siberians should have considered this before getting carried away with their desire for independence. Instead, they made a deal with the devil that bought them 30 years of suffering. With help from the shapeshifters and other mythic creatures of the Siberian wilderness, the Siberians broke away from Russia. However, no one knew the Siberian shamans obtained that alliance by bargaining with a powerful spirit that claimed all of Siberia as its domain. Oops. And, as the Siberians later found out, hated metahumanity and civilization. Oh, no. This is a, what, a spirit? Mm-hmm. We have a, a racist spirit. Well, it doesn't like civilization or metahumanity. Ah, uh, Yes. Anarchist speciesist spirit. <laughs> yeah, sorry. Yeah, an anarchist species spirit. Sorry. Yeah, yeah, sorry. Sorry. For many years, the Siberians had no choice but to suffer under the spirit's tyranny, enforced by the shapeshifters that worshipped it. A recent discovery around Lake Baikal gave them a new hope. However, and a rebel militia has unleashed a so far successful revolt. What happens now, especially in light of the infighting in Russia from the death of the general secretary, is anyone's guess. Few people outside the Russian Far East know much about the Yakut conflict. Here is the short history lesson. After the Lone Eagle incident and the breakup of China, the Russians reverted to authoritarian form, closing Siberia and reimposing hardships on the natives. After word of the Treaty of Denver spread from North America, some of the newly awakened Siberian shamans formed their own resistance. But the Siberians lacked a unifying figure like Daniel Howling Coyote to rally them around the cause. That changed in 2020, a cabal of Siberian shaman guerrillas organized an independence movement and launched their attack in 2031. While what Russia reeled in the wake of the crash, wielding powerful magic, the Siberian shaman summoned nature spirits to assist them, and their promise to restore the land brought the shapeshifters to their side. This huge magical advantage assured their victory. Or so goes the official story. According to the new resistance movement, the Sagan Zaba, the truth is different. While Siberian shamans did organize the independence movement, the bit about powerful magic and noble causes is an exaggeration. In reality, the shamans contacted a great spirit of the Siberian wilderness, known as Vernya, and it agreed to help if they agreed to protect the land. Assisted by nature spirits and shapeshifters, the Siberians broke away from Russia. 
though they failed to completely eject the Russians from the Far East. In the process of establishing the new state of Yakut, the Siberians found out just what Vernia meant by protecting the land. Large portions of the Siberian interior were declared off-limits to metahumans, and a significant number of villages had to relocate from the Siberian heartland to the fringes where they often suffered Russian border raids. Use of, quote, inappropriate technology was severely restricted, as were certain types of magical practices, like conjuring. These restrictions prevented Siberia from developing a vibrant, self-sustaining economy. Finally, to make sure the Siberians honored their end of the bargain, the shapeshifters that had once fought side by side with them became their overseers. Infiltrating Siberian society as spies, informants, and secret police. That is the brief and tragic history of the Siberian breakaway and the development of the nation of Yakut. There's a lot. There's there's like a whole world of lore just in Russia. There really is. I mean, especially what's still going on with the Yakut. That carries on even until the, the 2080s. The Yakut nation is still strong and they are still oppressing the Siberian people. Um, you will be, I don't know, somewhat happy to know that um, the government in Yakut granted shapeshifters the same legal rights as regular humans and metahumans. I'm sure they weren't pressured into doing that. Yeah, definitely. They just, they're like, we're the good guys now. To put it into perspective of what they have to deal with, most of the Yakut shapeshifters are bear or cat shifters. So either strong strong enough to fight their way out of it or nimble enough to just run away. Well, in particular, Siberian tigers and snow leopards. Mm. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah, why, why would you not? Those are dope choices to be shapeshifters for. Oh, God, it gets, it gets uh, uh, even, even worse, I guess. That's not as, true. That's a boss. Uh, many Yakut natives believe certain types of shapeshifters have specific duties. For example, many bird shifters seem to function as spies, while cat shapeshifters almost always serve as hunters and assassins. I mean, I feel like that just kind of makes sense. Am I crazy? Like, you utilize the strength of what a person can be can shapeshift into? Mm-hmm. Like, you know, an, an army of bird spies is not a <laughs> very foreign concept, like... That checks uh, out. As for Vernia, most ordinary Siberians are unaware of the spirit and know only that the government shares power with the shapeshifters. Even now, the majority of dissidents and rebels believe the shapeshifters control the government. They don't realize that someone else controls the shapeshifters. Hmm. So even though they're having this rebel force which is the Sagan Zaba that is rising up to fight back against their shapeshifter oppressors, they're still not aware that it's really a great spirit that is controlling them. And who knows who will win in this back and forth. But of course, uh, with the Yakut nation having large portions of its land off limits to its own inhabitants, it's seeing a lot of... Uh, trespass as well from other interested groups in that area for all of the uh, magical materials that can be harvested from the Siberian wilderness. Remember, we did mention one of them in a previous podcast where we talked about the, uh, the, under, the underbelly um, of the, the Ordo that is run primarily by a cabal of vampires. Ah, yes. The good old vampire cabal. Yep, Ordo Maximus. 
they they are interested in some of the things that are happening in that area and have their agents there swarming about that is uh the long and short of of russia there's a lot going on too much some might say (laughs) <laughs> Almost too much. I mean, you have the political vacuum uh, from the death of the general secretary. You have the corporation intrigue between Yamatetsu and Seder Krupp and the homegrown Russian uh, Zeta Imp Chem. And then you have the wilderness of Siberia that is under the control of shapeshifters and a great spirit. So who who knows what the what the spirits' plans are for Siberia? We can only speculate, especially since they don't like meta humanity or technology. So now, knowing some more about uh, the nation of Russia in the sixth world, would would you go there? Uh, no, I have no, as previously mentioned, no desire to go to Russia in the normal world. So sixth world Russia sounds terrifying. I think I have <laughs> less. Yeah. I, it was already at zero. So like <laughs> negative interest, negative yeah. desire. Uh, I would only be interested in going to the anarchist island and um, watching the gang fight unravel between the sub pirates and the Vikings. <laughs> If That's wanted, fair. If I wanted to go to an anarchist island, I'd just go to Australia. There you go. <sighs> yeah, but they have mana storms there. Bro, that's still way more appealing than just the, the storm. Being in Russia. Being in <laughs> Russia is a mess. Yeah. You think Russia's a mess? You should wait till we talk about the breakup of China. I want. I, I can wait. I can wait. <laughs> Yeah, you you think there's enough different um, cities populating the Russian landscape. Wait till you hear about the breakup of China and the many different small nations that emerge from it. Foreshadowing. (laughs) Foreshadow running. Oh. Well, guys, I think that's where we will wrap it up for this evening as always if you would like to help us keep delivering this delicious cuts of juicy marbled lore directly to you brought to you by the vori mm-hmm. it's all full circle <laughs> full circle <laughs> full circle full stop <laughs> You can head on over to our Patreon at patreon.com slash critical underscore hits. And for just $5 a month, you can see behind the scenes, get a look at all of our upcoming flashy artwork that is on the way. Some of it is looking very cool. You get shouted out at the end of every one of our sinless episodes and is the only way where you will hear all of the upcoming Worm Talk episodes. Gotta be a patron to be able to listen to those. If you happen to be listening on those popular podcast places such as Spotify, if you could give us a rating and a share that would be fantastic to help get this out to other like-minded and interested people in the sixth world if you are listening to us slash watching but most likely listening on the youtubes please give us a like and a subscribe as we are trying to reach our goal of 1000 subscribers and finally you guys this is for This is for all of you. We have an affiliate link. You will find it down in the description of the episode. And this affiliate link is useful for drive through RPG. When you're ready to get new books or explore a new RPG setting, head on over to drive through RPG. Look through what they have to offer. You'll find just about everything that you could think of. And you've got modules and core books and rule books and setting books 
everything you could possibly want. And just drop in our affiliate link if you're going to pick up anything from there. It definitely helps us out, and we greatly appreciate it. Once again, thank you guys for listening. You are why we're bringing all this lore to you in a digestible, delicious form. And as always, we will see you all in the next one. The Tops Company Inc. has sole ownership of the names, logo, artwork, marks, photographs, sound, audio, video, and or any proprietary materials used in connection with the game Shadowrun. The Tops Company Inc. is granted permission to critical hits to use such names, logos, artwork, photographs, sound, audio, video, and or any proprietary materials for promotional and informational purposes on its website, but does not endorse and is not affiliated with critical hits in any official capacity whatsoever.